Hi, and welcome to Wealthion. I'm James Conner. Today, my guest is Neil Howe, and Neil is a historian, an economist, and a demographer and studies generational trends and how these trends impact society and the economy. Neil has written several books, including his latest book, The Fourth Turning is Here. And we're going to discuss with Neil the concepts behind this book. Neil, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in West Virginia? Very good. Thank you, Jim. Neil, before we examine your latest book, can you provide the backstory on how you and your partner, Bill Strauss, discovered that generational changes come in cycles or waves? Well, it was um, it was accidental and uh, it wasn't really what we were originally exploring. We wrote together for a long time. I mean, Bill passed away back in uh, 2007, but our first book, Generations, came out in 1991 a long time ago, and it was a generational biography of uh, American history. So we 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 told American history as a sequence of, of, of kind of generational stories, starting with the Great Migration to New England in the 1630s and kind of going forward, right? And what we noticed, uh, and that was our object, right, to write a generational history. Uh, we were boomers and uh, noticing that uh, our generation had always been a obsessed with the idea of generations. And we're interested in how different generations had different aspirations and wanted to leave behind different kinds of endowments than other generations. In other words, how do generational differences start? And, and why don't we get an historical perspective? Well, what we noticed is that not only our generations have always been very different going back to the very beginning, but these... Um, these uh, and and very striking, you know, one one generation comes of age during a war, the next generation are children during the war and see the whole thing very differently. <laughs> the the life lessons from that conflict, very different. Right. And as they age, these generations just think differently. They have different attitudes. They have different behaviors. They have different life perspectives. But one thing we noticed very early on is that not only are these generations different, these generational differences come in patterns, right? Certain kinds of generations always follow other generations. For example, a generation of uh, anti-establishment idealists, you know, raging against uh, the powers that be and want to create some idealistic better world. And, and to some extent, that actually characterized the Puritans under John Winthrop, you know, uh, a heavenly city on a hill and all that. I mean, you know, transplanting it to Boston. Well, the generation after them became widely known, uh, not just in England, but in the colonies as the Cavalier generation, <laughs> a generation attracted to wealth, riches, materialism, not all that different from Gen X following boomers. You know what I mean? Kind of you know, one to the next. And And what we found is that these kinds of differences uh, repeat themselves uh, uh, in American history. Um, uh, for example, following a generation like uh, like the Cavaliers or the Xers, uh, who were who were born in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you very often at the end of that have a moral panic over how badly kids have been treated, and you suddenly have a much more protected generation. Of course, that gave rise to a generation we described uh, in our original book, uh, the Millennial Generation. We we coined that term. So if you want to know where that name comes from, uh, that's from, from Bill and from me. Uh, we, we recognize that the children born after 19, uh, uh, in 1981, 1982 were much more protected, much more fussed over, much more special. You know, all those things we think about, all the, all the minivans and all the special protective gadgets we put around them. And the first cohort of that generation was going to come of age, actually would become the high school class of 2000 which is why we called them millennial generation, right? We were looking ahead to the year 2000. We said millennial makes sense. So if you want to know, if you want to know where that is, um, but that is a pattern. Uh, we saw something very similar after the lost generation, uh, who were the children of the 1880s and 1890s, uh, followed by the GI generation, who later became known as the greatest generation. They fought World War II. They were the generation of the, of the New Deal and the Great Depression. But they were uh, very protected children. Um, we had uh, the progressive presidencies uh, after the turn of the century, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And a very important part of the progressive movement was the protection of children. We forget about that. It was a huge moral panic over children back then. Uh, we wanted to get um, 
we wanted to get uh, you know child labor laws. You know, suddenly with teeth, you, we started giving children allowances for good behavior rather than letting them work in uh, cigar wrapping factories. You know, for twelve hours a day, uh, we we didn't like them to be run over by streetcars in the cities. We did everything we could do to enclose and protect their their childhood. Um, uh, the Harrison Drug Act kept drugs away from kids. We all remember back in 1900, Coca-Cola had the real thing, right? <laughs> and there was a lot of drugs out there for kids. And suddenly we wanted to protect them. Ultimately, prohibition itself was an attempt to keep alcohol away from family life and away from kids. And that had a profound impact on the type of generation the GIs became. Everyone says that the World War II made the GIs into a separate generation. That's not true. The GI generation, uh, uh, the generation of Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, you know, back in those 1930s movies, uh, even Jimmy Stewart, uh, was very different uh, even before World War II. And a lot of our book talks about how these generational, how this generational formation happens. So to answer your question, we discovered this, these patterns. We were not seeking them. And it was actually an unexpected result of our research and 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 later on we wrote a book we wrote we wrote a book and um you know we, we've written several books together on generations but later on in 1997 we wrote a book called the fourth turning and that was an attempt to sort of turn it around instead of looking at generations and then sort of an implicit cycle we looked at the cycle itself right and um one thing that that is very uh, that is consistent with this cycle. And I think, in fact, the two are kind of causally wed together is a very interesting fact about American history. And in fact, Anglo-American history going way back many centuries. And that is about every long human lifetime, about every 80 or 100 years, we have this enormous um, series of events, usually involving great conflict, which redefines our civic world, our political constitution, the world of infrastructure, economics, politics, right? Uh, our public world. Um, and we had in the in the colonies and, and certainly in, in Britain itself, we had the uh, the last the last quarter of the of the 17th century, which was not just the glorious revolution, but Bacon's rebellion and King Philip's war. It was a, it was a horrible period of sort of civic uh, 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 chaos, creative reconstruction, and violence, um, uh, which which Jefferson looked back to uh, later on. He he called Bacon's uh, Bacon's Rebellion America's first revolution, and and of course about a century later we had the American Revolution, right? And about again long human lifetime later we had the Civil War, and then the same period we had World War II and the Great Depression. And then the same period, here we are, right? So we're in the next fourth turning. And um, and I think there's a reason for this. It's generational forgetting. The generations which are shaped by those events become very powerful civic generations, very good at not only creating, but running strong civic institutions. And when they fade away, when they pass completely out, and even the children of those eras become uh, uh, begin to fade from power, uh, another crisis occurs, right? And and roughly halfway in between these, these great civic events uh, are the great awakenings of American history. And of course, these are uh, very conveniently in American history, these are numbered. So we call them the first great awakening, the second great awakening, the third great awakening, and so on. And, and many historians call the, the late 60s and 70s America's fourth or fifth great awakening, depending on whether you want to start your count with, you know, Jonathan Winthrop or John Edwards, you know, which century you want to start your count. But I think these are periods very unlike these fourth turnings, what we call fourth turnings, these civic reconstruction areas, where instead of reinventing the outer world, rebuilding the outer world, we rebuild the inner world, right? So these are the periods when we reinvent the culture, music, religion, um, and uh, anything having to do with meaning. Of course, this is when boomers came of age, right? And uh, so boomers like to think they have a monopoly on meaning, and they, they will until the time they die. Uh, this was uh, 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 
John McCain's quip about boomers. John McCain would have been a silent generation. He was born before the boomers, obviously. Uh, he 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 ran for the presidency back in uh, what 2008. Uh, lost. He was one of the very few silent who ever even run for office in America. Silent have not been a powerful political generation. They finally got a president, Joe Biden. Uh, and now I think we understand why not many silent have been elected. <laughs> so there you are. But John McCain once said about boomers, he said, everything they touch becomes more meaningful, but less effective. So, you know, I think we can sort of say that's a fair portrayal of boomers. And, and here they are, right? They are now America's senior leadership generation presiding over a fourth turning. The pattern that a generation born just after a crisis, indulgently raised in the aftermath of a crisis and coming of age with an awakening, later on in its old age, presiding over the next crisis is a pattern that's been repeated again and again. You think of Abraham Lincoln and, and, and uh, Emerson and Thoreau and Walt Whitman and that, that generation, the transcendental generation, they were entering old age of the Civil War. Uh, you think of the generation born after the Civil War. They were the, the wise old men of the New Deal in World War II. This is a generational pattern. This is fascinated. Uh, this, this fascinated us, and we've written quite a bit about it. Um, and and I will say this, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, so you're going to ask me more questions, but I will say this, that our basic thesis has not changed uh, since that first book in 1991. I mean, uh, the basic timing of it, uh, what, we predict, what we predicted back then was way in the future. Uh, today, we're here, and hence the title of my most recent book, The Fourth Turning is Here. Um, the, the publisher insisted on that title. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was Simon and Schuster. They said, "No, you got to have." I said, "No, let's have some other title." I, you know, I'm kind of tired of that. No, no, you got to put that on the cover. So we we did that, and and I think actually it does justice to the book because what it does is it brings this whole thesis up to today. And I think what we do in this book, which we didn't do in the 1997 book, which which a lot of people have read, is talk in much more detail about crisis about how it actually starts, how it evolves, how it ends, uh, and in which directions it could go. It usually involves conflict. And big question now, of course, is it going to be mainly internal or external conflict? Um, yeah, that's, that's how that started. Very interesting points there. And I think one of the things that really stood out to me in your comments was about child labor, child labor laws. And the, this is something we don't even think about now, even though that wasn't too many years ago. But now, you know, kids are in school, I don't know, eight hours a day, they come home, they might watch Netflix for a couple of hours, then get on their PlayStation for a couple of hours, then maybe go to hockey practice or football practice. And yet, you know, maybe not even 100 years ago, they were out in the fields, right, tending to their crops. or yeah, Unfortunately, now they're spending five hours on TikTok, and it makes me wonder, maybe that, <laughs> maybe what we used to have wasn't so bad. But anyway, go. <laughs> but no. your point, your point is granted, you know, um, but it, it, there are huge changes, obviously, that are secular, you know, big changes in, in how we live. But there is a profound cyclical pattern to how these things are introduced. Um, uh, back when Gen Xers were kids, no one cared about anything. You know, and no one cared about protecting them. No one even cared if they're wearing a seatbelt. You just told kids to do this, you know, or something, you know. And and uh, the devices you put on your stoves and your doors, you did with with back in the 70s you did with cellophane or, or rubber bands they, they had no products for it it was a huge industry that came about in the 1980s think about this fathers present at the birth of their children in the late 1970s it was only about 20 percent by the late 1980s thanks to the lamaze movement that was a big boomer deal back then uh it was about it was about 65 percent today it's about 80 percent fathers present at the birth of their kids so these have profound influences on how a generation uh is shaped those influences are as always happens with generations strengths and weaknesses i mean one of the great strengths of xers 
is that, yeah, there were throwaway kids and they grew up in the era of childless double horror movies. I mean, you know, no one really cared much about kids. Uh, if anything, the only uh, uh, the only interesting conversation was how you could prevent giving birth to them. I mean, these were the first kids people took pills not to have in the 1960s. And they, they were the period of a huge decline in the fertility rate, uh, both in Canada, by the way, and, and in the United States. And, and, and Xers understood that in the era of the, the, the you know, no, no, no fault divorce and the huge divorce revolution, and no one really took their interests much at heart. And they grew up to be somewhat um, uh, like Tatum O'Neill, you know, in, in all those movies she did, like Paper Moon, they, they were hard kids. You didn't want to hug these kids. And but that was his strength, right? Because they knew how the world really was at a very young age, and everyone thought that was really great. And just suck them with the reality early, um, and and that has given some real strength to Xers. They are very good at at handling reality, being survivors. Think of all these words that have followed them in the pop culture as they've grown older, um, and very good at handling risks. Very good at uh, going off the grid and knowing how to behave when the system isn't working. I think uh, millennials who are much more good, uh, much better at, at forming and, and uh, uh, functioning in groups and forming communities are, are may not be good, may not be as good as that, uh, you know, uh, off the grid survival aspect of life. Uh, and one fascinating thing about looking at generations is as they age and layer over each other, um, there was a, a, a Francois, Francois Littre, he was a, a French sociologist who wrote a book called uh, Social Generations. And he said that generations follow each other like tiles on a roof. You know, when you think about age and, and, and time, right, we all have these diagonal lines. That's sort of how generations fit together, right? But as you have these different generations aging on top of each other, so to speak, each brings something different, right? Each brings something important. Uh, that society needs, and I, I do think that 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 uh, different generations is a is a case of complementarity. Uh, yeah, they have conflicts, uh, they have disagreements, but overall, the result has been uh, complementary. So, Neil, you mentioned that your latest book is titled "The Fourth Turning Is Here." Maybe you can just touch on that and provide a, the gist behind it for those people who might not be familiar with it. Yeah, well, it it. It takes the same basic thesis of our original book, but it it um, it it uh, brings it up to date. I mean, you know, we we talk about we talk about Trump. We talk about uh, the the uh, the current kind of wave of populism and authoritarianism coming around the globe. I talk more in this book than we did in the original about. Uh, generational rhythms as a global uh, phenomenon, not just a U.S. phenomenon or American phenomenon. Um, the fact is, is that World War II and the Great Depression were global crises, right? And that we had a, uh, we, it, it impacted not just America, obviously, but the entire English-speaking world, all of Europe, including Russia and Asia. I mean, East Asia, South Asia, India achieved its independence, uh, uh, my God, uh, uh, all of East Asia went through a, a absolutely traumatic period. And then in the 1970s, uh, the world went through an awakening. It wasn't just in uh, uh, Berkeley or Columbia University. It was in Paris. It was in Prague. It was in Milan. It was in it was everywhere. It was in it was in Beijing. I mean, that was the time of the of the Red Guard uh, and the, the Cultural Gen Generation Revolution born after the the, the real Chinese uh, civil war and the revolution there, uh, throwing away 2000 years of Confucian culture. Uh, it was certainly all over Latin America, <clears throat> this rage of young people against <clears throat> the powerful institutions built by their, you know, World War II winning parents, right? This was global. This wasn't just America. And this is one of the reasons why we find these patterns toward, you know, uh, very often boomer aged ethnocentric rulers, you know, like a Narendra Modi or a Xi Jinping or, you know, the, the, the new guy who just got in Malaysia. I mean, you can go around the world now, just point them out, are the way they are. It's not just Trump. 
you know, it's not just even Jair or Bolsonaro. I mean, it's it's all over the place. And why this happens, we think we can explain it, right? And you touched on something I just want to clarify, but you said the 1960s was a period of awakening, and yet we saw a lot of turmoil during the 1960s with the assassination of JFK, MLK, also well, Robert the, Kennedy. The awakenings, the awakenings involve a tremendous amount of argument and violence. I mean, that is typical of awakenings. Uh, another awakening is uh, the 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 English Civil War. You know, we beheaded we beheaded Charles the first. Um, uh, but the what 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 is characteristic of an awakening is that it's tearing down the system, not so much um, not so much banding together and building up a new system. I think that was the difference between the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution, right? The English Civil War gave rise to a regime which quickly you know disappeared. And we had the Restoration. You know, it gave rise to nothing permanent. The Glorious Revolution, on the other hand. That was a crisis era. That was a fourth turning, and it gave rise to something permanent afterward, right? That lasted. That is the key difference between uh, an awakening and a crisis. An awakening is um, youth rising up to uh, uh, to overthrow institutions that are too strong, uh, and and to allow more individualism to thrive. A crisis is when youth band together to. Uh, reinforce and save institutions which are too weak, right? And that's the fundamental difference from today. Um, I think millennials are an order-seeking generation. They're not an order-fighting generation. I mean, I have millennials. I, you know, I talk to millennials about what boomers did back in the late 1960s and 70s. We thought, you know, income inequality, we hated it. It was this huge monolithic middle class. We thought it was terrible. All those suburban homes that all look just the same, you know, all built out of Tiki Tacky. That was a Melvina Reynolds song. You know, it was all those little homes all look the same. That was Pleasant Valley Sunday. That was like horror. That's the last thing we wanted. So we got rid of the middle class. We got rid of all those brightly colored homes. And I talked to millennials today and they said, that sounds really nice. Little houses, they all look just the same. Wait, you know, where's the middle class? Where can I sign up? I tell them, no, we, we got rid of it. <laughs> so, but you see, that's the difference, right? We were, uh, we were an order destroying generation for all the right reasons, because boomers always have the right reasons. You know, they always did things for the right reasons. But millennials are an order seeking generation. And I think that's how you explain this movement toward authoritarian leadership around the world. Millennials don't care as much about democracy, saving all the procedures and everything. They want a system that actually works. They see uh, ineffectiveness and sclerosis institutions around the world. They see institutions not doing anything anymore. Boomers when coming of age, we thought institutions work too well, right? That's, I think, a, a fundamental difference. So you are suggesting that we're in a period of crisis right now. Maybe you can just tell us when it started and when well, you... It it, it started with a global financial crisis, just like 1929. It started with the with the GFC, right, uh, 2008. And it will go for, you know, we reckon about 23 years or so. I mean, a typical, you know, phase of life. So that'll be a time when every, every generation will move into another phase of life. Uh, so it'll be over by the early 2030s. Um, and then we'll have a new first turning. So the first turning is, think of these like seasons of a year, right? So it's kind of like, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, uh, excuse me, spring, summer, fall, winter. And uh, the the first turning is when the, um, the, the profit archetype, this is the boomer-like generation is being born, right? The war child generation is coming into young adulthood. That would be the silent generation. And the war hero generation is beginning to move into midlife. That would be the GI generation, right? And that was the, uh, in America, that was the American high. That would have been the presidencies of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy. That was a period of great order, great prosperity. Institutions worked very well. Everyone knew what to do. Everyone was giving their marching orders. And uh, we were very prescriptive about how you ought to run your life. You know, I mean, if you were a, 
If you're a if you're a guy, you're supposed to go out and become a wage earner. If you're a girl, you're supposed to you know be become a homemaker. You know, everyone had their role, right? We felt very good about ourselves collectively. We we were pretty modest about ourselves individually. No one really talked about uh, um, you know soft drink ads back then were things like you know uh, say Pepsi please or something like that. You know, very decorous, very. You know, no do the do ads back then, right? Anyway, the 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 next season was the awakening, and that would would have been the late sixties, seventies, early eighties. I mean, that really started. Uh, it obviously was spearheaded by youth uh, boomers, uh, and it it started more on the left on college campuses, and particularly on cultural issues like the patriarchy and you know, burning your draft card, burning your bras, burning, you know, just burning all symbols of authority. And, but I think it, it, it rapidly shifted until by the late 1970s, early 1980s, more on the right. It was get rid of taxes, get rid of regulation. But the common theme was get rid of social obligation, allow people to do what they want. Right. And that was, that was very controversial at the time. And it involved a huge amount of screaming, you know, <laughs> particularly, kids against parents go back and watch all in the family you know and meathead is always just screaming at archie bunker anyway it it, it was a uh traumatic period um but we came out of that with a newly individualized society and i think the 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 third turning would have been the the you know basically the 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 early 1980s until the gfc and that was a period of of great individualism in america when we uh, less regulation, less taxes, less emphasis upon requiring anyone to do anything. You know, you go into a bookstore and the most upbeat books are about me, myself, and I. And all the downbeat books are about, you know, the end of society, the end of community, right? So this is typical of a of a of a of a third turning of a of the of the fall season, what we call unravelings, the uh what we call the nomad archetype, born born and raised during the awakening is beginning to come of age. This would be Gen X, right? But back in the, you know, that was in the roaring 90s, but in the roaring 20s, it was a lost generation, a very similar kind of generation coming of age. And the, the 1920s, the 1990s, uh, the 1850s, 1760s, these are all wild decades of, um, of uh, cynicism, bad manners, weak civic authority. And I think that was the period we went through back then. Uh, it was much the opposite of a high. Remember, during the high, institutions are strong, individual, individualism is weak. This is a time when individualism is strong. Institutions are weak, right? And I think ever since then, we've moved into the fourth turning. And that's when we rediscover community, we rediscover authority, um, and we, um, we refashion large civic institutions from the ground up. And typically the climax comes late in the period. So I think most of the heavy lifting is still to come. Oh, so if let's just assume we have another 10 years left of this crisis period and um, we're approaching the climax, what would you expect to happen? Well, typically, uh, typically conflict. I mean, I'll just throw it out there. I mean, all the total wars of American and sort of the, the whole Anglo-American tradition, every total war has occurred during a fourth turning and every fourth turning has had a total war. So that kind of gives you a clue, right? Um, and that means it's a dangerous time. It's absolutely a dangerous time. Uh, and one, one question I mentioned earlier is the whole question about will it be internal or external or some combination of the two? And I think that's one thing I actually talk about in the book is the extent to which um, conflicts are perceived as being external, internal. Obviously, the Civil War was almost entirely internal, right? Almost by definition uh, in, in our history. Although uh, even then, uh, typically what happens in a Civil War is the weaker a losing power always tries to draw in a foreign ally. I mean, that just always happens. During the American Revolution, the Americans drew in France, which kind of saved our ass, you know, ultimately, uh, at, at, at Yorktown and, and basically just diverting the Britain into doing a million other things around the world. So this, this typically happens. There is no unalloyed 
uh, purely external or purely internal uh, conflict. And we have to remember that we, we look back upon World War II as the, you know, the so-called good war is very clear, you know, who's going to win and so on. Very important to remember that up until about a year before Pearl Harbor, uh, we were a profoundly isolationist country. And that the big division in America was between left and right, uh, between those who favored the New Deal and those who hated it. I mean, half of America, I should probably less than half of America, thought of thought the 1930s were the red decade, and the other half thought it was the fascist decade. I mean, in the context of the Great Depression, liberal democracy seemed to have no future. It was either communism or fat. You know what I mean? It, it was a dire time in America. And the the um it as events showed right with with obviously the fall of france and then and then you know the putting through the big armaments bills the two navy bill and so on in congress america began to to galvanize uh, uh you know over the course of uh late 1940 early 1941 and, and ultimately into pearl harbor but but that was by no means foreordained right uh, uh and and most americans thought that the great depression never ended uh, by the end of 1940, you know, I think the the long term yield on bonds reached its all time low in um, uh, in 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 the middle of I think June of 19, uh, 1940, uh, and uh, we still had deflation. Unemployment was still in double digits. Most Americans thought the Great Depression was still not over, um, and it was a profoundly divided nation in terms of where we should go. I think I think the um, the similarities to today are kind of unmistakable, right? Uh, a nation divided with itself, with growing foreign threats, in a world where authoritarianism is now gaining strength. I mean, you know, you don't have to draw it out too much to 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 see that we're going through some of these same some of these same trends. Um, uh, a a an economy which is not providing high higher living standards for young people. Um, you see the the uh, a record share of young adults living with their parents. When was the last time we had that? 1940, right? Late 1930s. All the young people were living with their parents, just like today. I, uh, those Frank Capra movies, like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, you can't take it with you. They always show these old Victorian ramblers with the young adults living in the top floor, and you know, I mean, they're all living together. No one built new houses during the 1930s. But we kind of forget this, right? We forget how we replay these things. Um, and, and I think also the younger generation developed a collective persona as being better behaved and, uh, and, and better suited to, to um, uh, a more optimistic community-oriented approach to public, pro public problems than the older generation was back in the 1930s. I think we see that again too today. Every generation has its strengths and I think we see them manifested much the same way. Interesting comments. So let's talk about this division that we currently find ourselves in and it's not official yet, but it appears that Trump will be the nominee for the Republicans, Biden for the Democrats. And if Trump does in fact run and win, he will be the only other president who has ever come back after be, being defeated to win a second term. The only other president was Grover Cleveland. I recently saw a poll that 70% of Americans don't want another rematch, but yet here we are. And I'm just curious to get your thoughts on how this kind of fits into this whole crisis mode. Well, people don't want a rematch because right now people are driven by fear, not hope, right? So what people want is for the other person not to get elected. And then I think that's what's driving people to the very poor choices they feel. I mean, no one wants it, but my God, it's better than the other guy. And, you know, say what you want about uh, about the advent of, of Donald Trump uh, in politics. But uh, one thing he's certainly done, which uh, people, people uh, complained about for a long time, is he's driven a huge resurgence in political participation in America. By, by 2020, we had the highest participation in a presidential election in 100 years. 
<laughs> not quite going back to the war for Cleveland, but you know, going back to uh, around the time of World War One. So we are a different country now, right? We are a country driven by tribalism. Uh, we are trying to find community. And as we begin to find community, we first find it within our own tribe. So we are a, a country you know, divided by blue zone and red zone today, right? And in fact, we are even self-selecting by state and by community. People are moving you know, to, to have like-minded people around them. Uh, this is worrisome. Needless to say, because it always raises the question of what if, you know, the one half of the community just rejects the leadership of the other half at some critical point, right? This is the the, the problem of of, uh, of of civil conflict, right? And it could start in any number of ways. Uh, Barbara Walter, who wrote a, a very influential study, oh, came out about two years ago on civil wars around the world. Uh, she interviewed people. Uh, civil wars, I mean, from, you know, from 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 Burundi to Burma. I mean, all over the place, right? And uh, she said the one thing when she talks to people, they always say they never see it coming. They never thought it was going to happen. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, some of the most knowledgeable uh, uh, young diplomats uh, in, in Washington, D.C. in 19, in 1859 and 1860 uh, later wrote that they absolutely, no one saw it coming, right? Oh, it was just expressive voting and that we would call it expressive voting. You go out now and poll Americans and, you know, 50% of them think a, a civil war is, is likely in the next few years. Um, uh, a, 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 a large year, nearly half, say that, yeah, they would favor their own section of the country uh, seceding. And everyone says, well, that's just expressive voting. Well, I'm sure a lot of voters in the South in 1860 just thought, well, that was an expressive vote. But expressive votes can have consequences. And we forget that. They develop a momentum all their own, right? And, 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 and so I see that as, as, as an issue. Uh, there's a wonderful essay. I quote it in the book because I thought it was so important. It's by Carl Becker, who's an intellectual historian. I, I, I'm a big fan of his. He, he wrote some wonderful books um, on, on European history. But he wrote a uh, very influential essay in, eight, in 1940, uh, just a very dark time, obviously, for democracy in America. Uh, we had seen so many countries in Europe, you know, succumb to dictatorship, to fascism, either through, you know, being invaded or revolution and so on. And he said, what's the matter with democracy? What are democracy's weak points? And he came to the conclusion, it's kind of a dark essay, but really worth reading today. So one of the problems with democracy is democracy works best when there's really nothing important to talk about. <laughs> And I've, I've actually meditated on that ever since. He said, you know, when all you're talking about is the width of sidewalks and what size sewer pipe to put in and all that stuff, yeah, democracy works great. But whenever you're talking about fundamental values and the essential direction of the entire community, it no longer works because one side is never going to accept, right, the, the decisive outcome of the other side. And and that's what I mean. He was pointing exactly toward the situation we face today. So I am, I am worried about what's happening internally in America. I'm also obviously worried about what's happening externally because we live in a world in which the old concert of powers, shall we say, is completely broken down. I mean, we we no longer know if even NATO is worth saving. I mean, what is there now? It's just a bunch of powerful people out there could we're looking to grab whatever they can right now right and uh the what we used to call the free world is so disorganized it's unclear how they're going to respond right um and i think that invites uh, that invites these authoritarians abroad to act right uh to to show some initiative to take now well the taking is good um so and remember, these countries, too, are going through their own generational change. I mean, there's a reason why we have a leader like Xi Jinping in there and why we didn't have a leader like that, you know, uh, back in 2000 or 1990 and 1980. 
Those are much more deferential technocrats. We have a new kind of leader, and that too is explained generationally. There was a Gallup poll conducted recently which said that 49% of Americans are independent. So they're not Republican, they're not Democratic. But And what's really driving those numbers are this younger generation that you referred to earlier. There's a real sense of disillusionment among them. How do you think... How do you think they're going to vote? I mean, I know you can't really answer that, but I'm sure you have some sort of idea how that might impact the upcoming election. Uh, you know, that's a great question. I've written about it recently on Substack. I think there's definitely a, a, a swing toward Trump. I mean, there's no question about it. In fact, if you look at the New York Times Siena poll of the, you know, six, seven battleground states, among uh, uh, over age 45, there isn't much change since 2020. All the changes among younger people. And what younger people are saying is, no, we certainly don't like Trump on abortion. We'd prefer Biden there. In other words, the various cultural issues they drip. But the, the issues that matter most to them, the economy, uh, overwhelmingly uh, prefer Trump. Now, you could, you could ask how much they remember of Trump or how much they, they really know about it. But anyway, this is their perception. I think that the, uh, the vibe session is underrated. I think there is serious obstacles for young people to name the economy. I think they feel it. Uh, we we don't count uh, mortgage interest in the CPI, as you know, so that's sort of out there. And the fact that people can't even begin to finance the home that they want or even change location in America because everyone's locked into these, to these uh, long-term uh, lending arrangements is a real problem, particularly for young people. Um, and, and obviously, one big issue, which is rising in salience now for all age brackets, is immigration. Um, and that is definitely helping Trump. And I think also the widespread perception that, um, and this is news to no one, that Biden's too old. He's no longer effective. He can't really, you know, he can't show strength or determination to, you know, foreign leaders and, and all of the other complaints that people have about Biden. But the biggest shift we see among young people... I will say, interestingly, on this question of independence, yes, they are independent of political party, but if you actually poll them as, you know, leaning conservative or leaning, you know what I mean, sort of leaning Democrat or leaning conservative, there's usually no doubt on most of them, you know, which way they go. In other words, they don't affiliate with the party, but they're usually pretty clear on which, which side they go. It is true that these independents include most of the kind of undecideds. And a lot of these undecideds are low motivation types, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the big debate among all, every political scientist and every sort of political advisor is, what do you do? Do you go more to motivating your base and making sure that all those people who may not vote get out there? Or do you, and then that would, of course, you know, amping up your message, you know, becoming, if anything, more extreme. Or do you tone down your message and try to go more toward the middle? Uh, that's an old debate. Um, there's no question. I think uh, uh, Donald Trump has surprised everyone and surprised a lot of people in all of his elections by being amazingly successful of getting a lot of uh, 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 working class people, particularly non-college working class people who never voted in the past to come out and vote. I mean, that's his signature, right? He's been very successful at that. Uh, and, you know, we're going to see. It's it's still a long time uh, until until November. A lot can happen around the world. A lot can happen at home. Uh, I don't know, in in uh, in in uh, in uh, uh, trial courts, uh, <laughs> so much out there. So you touched on the economy. And why don't we go there now? Because. You're suggesting a lot can happen in the next 10 years. And we have so much going on right now. I mean, we have a it's a presidential year, but there's a lot of back and forth about interest rates. Are they going higher? Are they going lower? I think the, uh, the lots the of chatter. Question, so we do a we do maybe I should tell people about, by the way, our our uh, substack. It's called Demography Unplugged. So if anyone's interested, just you know, type in my name, Neil Howe, Demography Unplugged. But we do all kinds of things. Uh, we do a weekly podcast, we do uh uh, a bunch of sort of demographic reports on demographic trends around the world. Uh, and we, one of the things we do is a, um, all about the indicators, which comes out every month and goes into detail about all of the sort of the, the, 
you know, recession indicators, you know, where, where are we right now in the business cycle? Um, but uh, over the last two or three months, I think the big news in the economy that has been underreported is the, the uh, according, at least according to the CPS data, a huge slowdown in employment growth, right? Employment's no longer growing and everyone's mesmerized by what they call the CES number, which is this, you know, establishment survey, you know, but this establishment survey is increasingly out alone, all the other surveys showing no growth in employment anymore. And interestingly, foreign born employment, which by the way, has been the supercharged reason why this expansion lasted so much longer than economists think. Two thirds of all employment growth in 2023 uh, in the United States economy was foreign born workers, right? Uh, we we show that. I mean, you know, CPS has it every every month. You can follow it. It's it's no mystery. Uh, and this is remarkable, right? Uh, 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 U.S. born workers have showed virtually no growth uh, since January of last year. Well, that's kind of amazing, you know, for the so-called superheated American economy. But even now, foreign born workers is beginning to peak and it's beginning to level off, right? At a, at a very high level, we've had this enormous surge post post COVID. I understand in Canada you've had something a little similar too. So, it'd be interesting to c compare experiences on that. I think in general, Canada as a, has a very high net immigration rate, higher than than the U.S. You know, as a share of population. But we are definitely ourselves, America, the United States is is far above its 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 historical, even its recent historical average in terms of immigration. I think there are two things are going to happen coming up. Uh, either the economy continues to decelerate and we go into uh, recession territory, uh, or the uh, things begin to tighten up for foreign born workers. As you know, Biden is beginning to put in place, he's totally playing defense now on immigration, right? So he is beginning to put in place all these new blocks and all these, these new uh, policies. Uh, obviously, uh, if, if Trump gets elected, we all know what he's going to do, right? So that's going to accelerate that. As usual, we do things at the worst possible moment. I suspect that by, if Trump is elected and comes in and puts all these, you know, blocks or reversals on immigration, it probably is going to be a time when net immigration is going to be going <laughs> in reverse anyway, if the economy is slowed down, right? Uh, uh, it's 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 probably at the same time when the economy is is slowing down that we'll finally decide to get serious about the budget deficit. You remember that's what we did after the GFC, right? <laughs> we had this huge high unemployment. We said, okay, now's the time to cut the deficit. Well, that probably extended uh, economic stagnation for another two or three years. But it's interesting that uh, I, I think that just proves the lesson that the political timing. Uh, is is it it rarely matches economic timing, right? Uh, people sometimes become roused to act politically at probably not the optimal moment that it would make sense. And so that's the, what you're expecting in the short term. But what if we look out five years? I think, or the, look, I think, I think the long I think the long term is one of uh, diminished GDP growth around the entire high income world, simply because of uh, the fact that the look. By 2027, 2028, going by the UN projections, amazingly enough, the uh, working age population of not just the high income world, but the emerging market world is, is no longer going to be growing. It's actually going to be declining. I I'm, I'm throwing in China here, right? Um, that is incredible. I mean, ever since Adam Smith, right? The whole premise of a, of a of, you know, capitalist growth was always predicated on demographic growth, which is usually contributed about half of, of overall GDP growth. You know, the other half being productivity, right? Uh, uh, labor productivity. Well, that whole part of GDP growth is going to be missing. And increasingly, when we look at these, um, the, these countries, which no longer have uh, growing working age populations, working age populations are decline. I'm looking at Japan, Southern Europe, and so on, Eastern Europe. Um, what we see is the presence of, of what you can call aging recessions, which means even in a normal year of full employment and, and maybe a 1% of, you know, 1% per year productivity growth, 
if their working age population is declining by over 1%, which is true for a lot of these countries now, they will experience a recession. So you've noticed, right, that Japan seems to just be dipping in and out of recession now, but in kind of a normal year. But that is what we need to get used to, the concept of an aging recession. We are now, the, 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 the emerging market world and the high income world is now below replacement rate fertility. And it's inevitable that this whole world is going to start experiencing depopulation first in its working age population and ultimately go out of, you know, two or three more decades, ultimately in its entire population. This could be a very different world, very different demand for investment, low, less demand for investment, perhaps less productivity and learning by doing because we won't be investing as much. Um, in other words, looking at the long term is a very different kind of world. I'm speaking here now as a demographer, not so much as a historian of cycles. <laughs> but I think long term, I do think that one thing that may happen in the next first turning, we talk now to come back to turnings, come back to cycles here, is that if we create strong institutions and a more, you know, stable family focused social world uh which typically happens after a crisis right we will see a fertility recovery we've seen that every time after big crises so you you know what i mean i'm, I'm kind of looking at this not just as a secular trend but as as a rhythm as well i do think there will be some recovery in fertility uh as there was after world war ii as there was after the civil war you know and, and so on as you as you can imagine well, Neil, that was a fascinating discussion. And as we wrap up, if someone would like to learn more about you or follow you on your various social media platforms, where can they go? Uh, the the best place is uh, uh, just retail. It's uh, Demography Unplugged. Uh, it's on Substack, but just, just type in Demography Unplugged uh, and you will get there. And uh, we, we, we have We've been really delighted by how many subscribers we have and how many you know listeners we have, uh, but uh, we we can always use more, and I always invite more people to listen to us. And I'm sorry, did you also mention that you have a podcast? Yes, same thing. It's all on demography unplugged. So you just sign in there. A Substack is great because they have a little you know app you put on your phone, so you can just listen to all of them. It's it's just like the Apple app or anything else. So you know. And if somebody wants to check out your various books, can they find them on Amazon? They're all on Amazon. They're all in print, believe it or not. Even the ones that were long, long ago. I think the only one that may not be in print is a is a book we did on Gen X in 1993 called uh, 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 13th Gen. Uh, but all the rest are in print. And... Um, and uh, obviously, the one that's selling best right now is the fourth turning is here. That came out last July, uh, and there's an audio book. It's uh, my voice on on all of it, so you can get the whole thing read that way. I don't know if you've ever done an audio book, but uh, it's a grueling experience in the studio. You know, oh, I can imagine. I can it's, imagine. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good two weeks uh, all day. You know, just uh, grinding away. So. And so can I assume your next book is going to be on Gen Z's? <laughs> I don't know what my next book's going to be. Um, it could be on something very different. Um, I don't know. I, I, that's that's a great question. I'm still recovering from the book I just did. That's That's hard enough. Well, that was a great discussion. And once again, I want to thank you for making time for us today. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks so much, Jim. Great to be here. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Neil Howe. And as Neil suggested, there's a lot happening in the economy right now. And if you need help in preparing for your financial future, consider having a discussion with a Wealthion endorsed financial advisor at Wealthion.com. There's no obligation to work with any of these advisors. It's a free service that Wealthion offers to all of its viewers. Once again, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Wealthion.com, and hit that notification button to be kept up to date on future events. We have a lot of great content coming out in the coming weeks. Once again, thank you for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.